Father, I thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit that is here tonight. And Lord, I ask you that you would escort us, you would guide us, you would lead us into beautiful things that are on your heart. Father, that you're so wise, that you've planned things from the beginning, that you would magnify the beauty of your heart and your son. Lord, we want to be a part of that. We thank you, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. Normally on Friday nights, I teach through John 16, but uh, since we have the School of the Messengers here, that's a good uh, blessing, huge, but really it's because of what happened to me yesterday. That's the bigger reason. And I had a quite a day with the Holy Spirit yesterday, and you only get one or two of those maybe a year, sometimes one or two of those in a decade or two, but a very powerful day. And I'll give you just a snapshot of where it's going and then break it down. There's about five or six uh, components, kind of moving parts to this. And so I'm at home and I'm watching uh, YouTube on Israel News, these kinds of things. And the phrase gets mentioned regularly, preemptive strike. And they're saying, you know, the Hamas is going to. Then the other cha- the other YouTube channel says, no, no, it's Iran's going to. And the other says, no, it's it's uh, Netanyahu and, and Israel. No, no, it's Hezbollah. Anyway, pre-empti- a preemptive strike. And a little bit later, not just that moment, but the Lord speaks clear to me and says, I have good news. I have a preemptive strike against the enemy's plan. And I have been planning this preemptive strike from before the ages. And it will succeed. And it will be f- covered with mercy and love and beauty. Well, the enemy's plan, and we'll get to it, and most of you know it very well, but maybe not real deep. The Revelation 12, verse 10, very famous, Satan is called the accuser. This will seem like an exaggeration, but accusation is actually his number one tactic. It's not even fear. It's not even murder. It's accusation. We'll get there in a few minutes. A lot of folks know he uses it, but they don't realize it's actually number one in terms of his weapons against the body of Christ. And the Lord was downloading these things. Uh, I mean, download. I mean, they were touching my heart and becoming clear and clear and clear as uh, I'm as I'm before Him because I start praying for Israel. And while I'm praying for Israel, suddenly I began to travail in the Spirit and, and groan in the Spirit. And, and and those of you that know me, I don't like people that make up stories like that. <laughs> like, oh, come on. And uh, it, I want it to be real or, and I'm very, I, uh, I'm captured. I go, what, what's going on? And I just, I'm there uh, travailing in the spirit yesterday. And I'm going, this is important. This is about Israel and the news and, and Israel. And, and I was actually watching a show, of which I'll have in the notes later, uh, about the death camps in Israel in 1941, even before the, the gas chambers, a couple of years before that. And I was looking at him and I'm thinking, this is where the enemy wants us to go. Then I start travailing. I'm travailing for Israel. And this is when the Lord speaks. I begin to write probably three hours. You know, you don't really time these things. Just writing and writing and writing and weeping and writing and weeping and insight coming. And my spirit just really vibrant. And the Lord is saying that Satan's plan is to accuse the global body of Christ because, and I never fully understood this, I had hints of it, he wants to hinder the body of Christ from being vessels of mercy and glory that provoke Israel to salvation. I mean, Satan hates the body of Christ, but he really wants the body of Christ taken out of the war so they can't impact Satan. Because in Romans chapter 9, verse 23, I don't have that verse on the notes, the Gentiles at the end of the age, I mean through history too, but mostly at the end of the age, they're vessels of mercy prepared beforehand for glory to provoke Israel. And so though that's happened through through history a bit, but there's an explosion 
of the grace of God on Gentiles as vessels of mercy, meant by God to provoke Israel to the beauty of Jesus. But if the body of Christ gets embroiled in accusation, they will turn on each other, and then Israel will not be provoked. It's not going to work, but that's what he wants. I like what uh, Dave Schleicher said in the 5 o'clock session tonight. He said uh, it was God's plan. He gave most of the power politically, economically, because he's going to show his glory by giving him all the power and then showing that it's totally ineffective against his plan. Well, he's not only orchestrating, raising up an antichrist, and the Lord's going to, I'll say this in a strange way, flex his muscles. Really, what I mean, show the glory of his beauty and his majesty and his mercy. He's going to magnify himself in that context of the antichrist being on the world stage. It's not an accident. The Lord, he, it's his plan. Well, also in the Lord's plan, there's, it's a prominent part of his plan. There's a betrayal culture in society but more dangerous is the betrayal culture within the body of Christ. And it's, it's uh, quite a few verses on it. In the last semester of the John 16, I gave several sessions the prominence of betrayal in God's end times plan. But the, pro the point is God has allowed it to happen to magnify mercy because he's got a plan to reverse Satan's accusation and bring it to nothing. That's his plan. But we've got to understand what he's doing because the Lord wants to do this through people who volunteer freely. He's going to have a hundred million, a billion. Well, we talk about the billion soul harvest, but a hundred million, a billion, whatever the numbers are of Gentiles that are going to move in the direction of deep love and mercy, even towards their enemies. They're going to be vessels of mercy to the people who are against them, to the people who are resisting them. And that's going to prepare them. They're going to go deep in God. And the Lord has them ready to be vessels of mercy for Israel at the end of the age. But they've got to volunteer freely to do it. But the Lord's got that plan. He knows what he's doing. And that's what we're talking about tonight. Okay, the this uh, title, I don't know if I'll like this title tomorrow morning, but because I wasn't trying to, I, they said, what are you going to call it? I go, I don't know. You know, I heard from God yesterday, something like that. <laughs> but this is an urgent call, not this weekend, for this next five years is what I mean, 10 years. For the body of Christ, I'm, I'm talking about 100 million. I'm not talking about our local little setting here, but yeah, we're involved. To engage in a preemptive strike against Satan's strategy to launch a accusation to destroy the body of Christ. The Lord wants to strike back at that strategy of Satan. And at the end, I'm going to give three simple uh, actions that uh, the body of Christ is to be involved in that are preemptive to bring this plan, this strategy of accusation to cause it to fall to the ground and not succeed. First, I shared this the last couple of weeks. So I'm going to be really brief on this. And if you want more details on this, I have some on, on my apps. Just I made, a, I made four sessions on my app just yesterday on all of this stuff. So I got a lot more detail coming out in the next few weeks on my app, just on this stuff. I don't apologize for wanting to repeat this and emphasize and emphasize and emphasize. We've got to get what's going on so that we freely volunteer this painful, glorious journey of love that's counterintuitive to the human heart. Because what the body of Christ is going to exhibit is very opposite of what we're naturally prone to. And that's what makes it so beautiful. And that's what points the nations to God's heart because it's supernatural. Well, that starts off my, my thought, my uh, uh, premise is the end time church will be a, a David generation. And you hear a lot of biblical uh, characters or, or personalities. You know, it's the, the Daniel generation. It's the Joseph generation. It's the Joshua generation. And, and I appreciate all of those. But in a very specific way, biblically, the end time church will be responding to God according to the model that King David set forth. 
In Isaiah chapter 55, we'll read at verse 4. Because I don't want to develop all this introductory stuff because I've done it a bunch of times, but God says, I've given David as a witness. He's a model. He's going to be a model for the people. Now, this is Isaiah writing this 300 years after David's already died. This is 300 years later. And so that you know the timing indicator, this is about the end of the age, verse, verse 5. Isaiah said, this is going to happen when the nations of the world run to Israel because God's glorifying Israel. That's not happened yet. So David's a model, a witness He's a picture of what God wants in the hour when God glorifies Israel and all the nations run to Israel, which is yet future. So this is an eschatological, an end-time passage. Paragraph B, David's the only man in the Bible that God called, God himself called him a man after God's own heart, several times. But Jeremiah 3, this is an end-time passage, he's going to raise up shepherds after God's own heart, clearly a David reference. And just so that you know, it's an eschatological or end time passage, verse 17, it happens, when does God raise up shepherds like David all over the earth? When Jerusalem is called the throne of God. That's obviously the context of the second coming. Well, paragraph C, what is God raising up in relationship to Jesus's return? The tabernacle of David. And there's many more passages, but I just wanted to make that point and then move on. Paragraph D. Psalm 18, which I shared on two weeks ago, October 6th on a Friday night here. I am just absolutely gripped with Psalm 18. It is, it is one of the most significant detailed Psalms for the end time David generation. Psalm 18, it's 50 verses. There's so many dimensions to it. And again, I taught on it. I'm just scratching the surface. But, but uh, two weeks ago on October 6th, and I sent out the, the transcript about that. Because what I always do is do the handout that I drop a transcript in it about a week later. So that some folks like the detailed version. I'm one of those guys, so I like handouts. I like transcriptions. Some folks don't care. But so don't worry about it then. Just delete it. But if you like that, I want to encourage you to take a peek at that. And I talk about a lot of the, the value of, of, Isaiah, of Psalm 18, really important for us. Well, it's really personal to me, Psalm 18, because paragraph E, I've shared this many times over the years, but for those that are new with us, you would think, what? What's that mean? It was my first prophetic word experience I ever received as a pastor. It was 47 years ago. I have the date there, 1976. I'm, I'm not into the charismatic church at this time. I love Jesus, but I, I don't know about tongues. I'm against tongues. I'll just be honest. I was against tongues. Okay. And I, I didn't like some of this hoopla stuff in the charismatics. And so this lady with a proven prophetic ministry, for some reason, I'm in a setting and she's prophesying over me. And the fire of God is coming on me. I've never had the fire of God coming. Like, what is that? And maybe I've only had that five or six times in 50 years. So it's not like a daily thing. But I'm alerted. I don't know what's, and I got this little, not a heavy, I don't exaggerate, but this kind of gentle breeze, like just the wind of the Lord, just a teeny bit. Not, not and if I had a, fly, a feather, it wouldn't have bent it over. It wasn't heavy, but it was like, what, what's going on here? And she gives me about five or six words. I'm only going to give you one, one of them, not because it's private, because I want to get to other points. She makes it clear to me Psalm 18 is going to be a really important passage in my life. I don't know anything about Psalm 18. I didn't even, never read it as far, probably I did and just didn't know I did That it would have a very important part of my life journey and it would be have a por very important part of my life messaging. Psalm 18, 50 verses, like, ugh. I mean, I read it, I didn't even like it, to be honest. I mean, really, it seemed confusing. And then she said something that really perplexed me. She goes, in the, in the future, you're going to have many wars. And she meant conflicts. Like David, you'll be like David, have many wars. 
Well, David's were military conflicts as well as social conflicts. He had many conflicts. David had over 15 in the Bible. We got it somewhere later. I'm not going to spend time on that. Fifth, over 15 different betrayal scenarios in his life where family members betrayed him more than once. 15 different scenarios. And many of them were repetitious betrayals. There's no one in the Bible that has been betrayed more on record than, than King David, far more than anybody. And he's a model because betrayal is going to be a key part of the end time church. You know, give a little bit more on that as to why that's such an important uh, thing to understand. Well, he had military wars, but he also had social relational wars. I mean, about almost 10 of these 15 were family members, people he was related to. And they were team members. They were people in his army, in his command units. It's intense. Well, she goes, you're going to have many wars. You're going to be have much opposition all through your ministry. Well, I'm a brand new pastor. I'm on my first year, and everybody likes me. At least I think they do. I go, I'm having many wars? What are you talking about? And then she says the oddest thing. She goes, and the Lord, she gave about five points, but this is the one I want to hit. Uh, Psalm 18, verse 35. She goes, but God's gentleness is what's going to make you great. Gentleness. I don't know what that means. Well, I came to understand it, that God would be gentle with me and my deficiencies, my failures, my weaknesses, my lack of follow through on things, he would be gentle with me while he was getting my attention. But that was to produce a generosity. I don't know. I mean, a gratitude in me that would make me be generous to be gentle to other people. And when you, when the Lord's gentle with you and you connect the dots, you become very grateful. You're far more tenderized to be gentle to other people. Because you're going, yeah, sure. And you take a look up and say, I know that you know that I know that you know. You're so nice to me. I'll be nice to them. Because the Lord, his message is, I like them as much as I like you. Even though they're, they don't like you, I like them. They don't like you and you're in a conflict, but I like them. And I want you to be a part of my heart to love them. Be gentle to them. And so the Lord was saying that, he was inviting me to greatness, not greatness before men, not greatness, uh, big impact, not that kind of greatness. Though when I stand before him on the last day, I would have a testimony. I was gentle to people who were not kind to me. And the Lord would say, you did it. That's where your greatness lies if you do it. Okay. Well, I didn't realize 47 years ago, that would be a critical part of the preparation of the end time bride. It all makes sense. Well, all much more sense than it did back then. Well, paragraph F, I have three reasons why Psalm 18 is important to the end time church. On my, the transcription and handout from two weeks ago, I have five reasons. So there's more than that. I'm not even going to go through, I'm not even going to go through those. You can look at them later. I just want you aware there's real reasons why Psalm 18 is really important. Because I want you in your heart to say, I mean, this is must read material, Psalm 18. I want you to say, I don't really know Psalm 18. And I'm like you, Mike, I read it. It's kind of a little, Confusing to be honest, but okay. Note to self: I'm gonna, I'm gonna go after this. That's why I put that paragraph in there to make you, hmm. Okay, that doesn't mean this week or this month you've got to devour it. Somewhere in the next year or two, you really want to go on a journey with the Lord on Psalm 18. It will impact you and your family and your friends. It really will if you get a hold of this. Paragraph G. Now this is an odd thing but a very important one. David says in verse six, paragraph G, he goes, in my distress, he had all these trials going, and I won't break those down right now. Lots of conflicts and military, his life being threatened. He had some spiritual compromises, all these things happening. There's a mountain behind, I was in distress, verse six, when you know the story. But in the other transcriptions, I, I give details on that. I called on the Lord. And he heard my voice from his holy temple. Now, there is no temple in Jerusalem yet because David's son builds the temple the next generation. So there is no temple. He's talking about the heavenly temple where the realm of glory is. He goes, I cried out. People are attacking me. I'm getting betrayed. 
My life, I'm about to die. I'm suffering, suffering, suffering. And God, you heard me from the realm of your glory in your temple. And here's the, the key word, verse 7. I don't have it underlined. Then the earth shook. Then there's earthquakes, fire, hail, lightning, all of these. It actually has 12 different dimensions, but I'm not going into it tonight. Actually, that's what I was going to do tonight was these break down this realm of glory around the heavenly throne that actually has tokens of expression on the earth when God's salvation purposes are going forward, his global salvation purposes are going forward in a distinct way, in a way that changes history. I mean, his salvation purposes are always going forward. But I mean, in major ways that shift history, the glory realm around the throne, there's tokens that break into the natural realm. Moses had the most of anybody. David had the second most, and he has 12 of them here. The, the, I read commentaries, and I go, oh, David's doing poetry. I couldn't know this, this happened. David's in a battle. I, it doesn't record the battle, but he says, when I cried out, this is what happened. David's in a battle, for instance, and I'll give a whole lot more detail next Friday or Fridays keep getting interrupted. I keep trying to do this thing. So I've learned to send the note out. I'm planning to do Psalm 18, the heavenly realm of glory, next Friday. So I'm going to try next week. But the Lord's just shifting things around and setting things up. So that's I'm going to go with him. And I know you all like that. But uh, but I've, I've, I've put a lot of time and energy on the realm of his glory. And, and I call it the heavenly storm glory. That's a weird term. I just made it up. It's a really weird term because around the throne, look at paragraph H, around the throne, there are storm-like manifestations around the throne. And there's a lot of verses. I mean, it's exciting. But the point is, when God's salvation purpose is on the earth, when he intervenes and he brings them forward in a, he advances his kingdom, his salvation purposes in a way that shifts history, that realm, tokens of it break out on the natural realm. And the end time church is going to experience this far more than Moses or David. And I got a lot of Bible verses to back it up, but they're verses you don't think about because you just don't usually have a reason to put them all on one big document. It's like, my goodness. It's one of the major themes of end time prophecy that you don't think about how the realm of glory, the storm glory, because the storm glory around the throne is not negative. It's bright, powerful, beauty and majesty. And when it touches on the earth, sometimes it destroys enemy armies and sometimes it release, it brings great deliverances. It's got both dimensions when it touches the physical earth, the physical realm. Big, big, big subject. I love this subject. But the end time church is going to actually operate in this a bit. But we don't know much about it. We don't know how much is in the Bible. We don't know how important that praying for these manifestations of glory in the natural realm are going to be. But the church is going to get educated on this. And Psalm 18 is a roadmap to get us educated on about 25 things, actually. That's one of them. Paragraph J, I mentioned that the end time church will have this, these manifestations far more than Moses. And Moses was the most intense. Again, then David would be second, then Elijah would be third if I had to pick them. But look what uh, it's going to happen in Acts chapter 2. Blood, fire, smoke, I mean, coming from the sky to the earth. And we're thinking, well, okay, blood, the blood is, no, somebody's getting stabbed or with, a, with a sword on the earth and bleeding, that too. But you'll be surprised how much Revelation 8, Revelation 9, blood's coming down with fire. And it's coming down in answer to the prayers of the saints. And it's coming against the Antichrist empire to destroy his resources and to magnify the power of Jesus through the praying church. Big subject for another day. But I, again, hopefully next week we'll look at it or the week after, whatever. Big topic. Okay, paragraph K. Persecution and betrayal are going to greatly escalate in the days ahead. They're growing fast now. Uh, 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 persecution. It hasn't hit the West much. I gave a, a several sessions in our last semester on Friday nights here on why persecution is 
Biblically, Jesus said, and, and many of the prophets, it's going to happen. It's coming to the West. And it's coming sooner than we think. But we look at persecution and or betrayal because not all betrayal is persecution. Not all persecution is betrayal. Those are two but separate things that overlap. Many times overlap, but many times don't. But the biblical view of this is that persecution is a, an expression of Satan to try to destroy our faith, and persecution is a gift of God to enhance our faith. Both of them are true, and there's plenty of verses on it. The apostles saw it as a gift. At first they didn't, but they all did at the end. This is a huge gift because Persecution, what it does, the same as betrayal, it does something in our life that changes our conversation. When there's pain, the conversation of the human heart changes. You talk to God different. You ask different questions. You talk to your family different. You give different sermons. You have different conversations or, you know, around the coffee pot at work or however that, that goes. Things get become very different when pain gets in the equ equation. And then people start searching, what's God saying? Where's this going? What's God happening? I, Anyway, I don't want to spend too much on that because I've spent a lot of sessions on that and got lots of, on the internet on that. Paragraph L, just from our prophetic history, and some of you don't know what I mean by that. And that's okay. I'm not going to go into that. Five times in 1983, the prophetic word came and said it would be confirmed by a shift in the weather pattern at this day or this time. And it happened five on the day, like it was said ahead of time. That's a little whisper from the heavenly realm. I mean, intense weather, strange weather in itself is not. There will always be a lot of that. And there's going to be a lot more of that. But when it has a prophetic purpose and it's even mentioned ahead of time and released by prayer, you want to ask the question, is this one of those, those little sparks, those little embers from up there? And anyway, we can talk about that more at another time. Okay. Paragraph O. Now, when we study the life of David, which is First and Second Samuel, the two most obvious characteristics of David and the way he responded to people, there's two of them that stick out far above all the others. I've taught the life of David maybe 10 times in 50 years, meaning where I taught it for 15 or 20 sessions or more or something like that, you know, like for a whole bunch of weeks in a row. I love it. I just love it. I've been captured with the life of David I mean, ever since, you know, this lady speaks this word, I say, I'm going to go after this. And, and there's still a lot I have to learn about it. But when you think of David's spiritual life with God, this one thing, I gaze on beauty, I delight in the Lord. There's a lot of spiritual dynamics, him and God. But when it comes to how he relates to people, two of them stick out far above every, every, all the others. Number one, because these play into Psalm 18. I, I mean, they're into the storyline and they inform us as to where we're going. I'm talking about the global body of Christ. In the uh, decade to, or two or three to come, who knows how much time we have. But I know we're getting closer and closer to things really escalating at a whole nother level. I said in January 2000 or February, I said the 2020s will be the most dramatic transitional decade in human history. Not, in, not just in the last hundred years, in human history. There will be more dramatic global change in the, in the 220s than any time in history. And just so you know, that wasn't like some great word about a thousand other people said it too. So I'm not trying to think, I prophesied. But it was really clear. And uh, we're at 223, 224, 225. It's going to be far more intense than the last three years. And I think the 2020s are only going to be surpassed by the 2030s. It, it's... It's game on. We're in a new era of human history leading up to the coming of the Lord. And that's why I love your hunger for this forerunner messaging and stuff. But anyway, let's go to David. Number one thing that David sticks out over and over and over is how David trusted God to vindicate and deliver him. When he got, now, when he, if he's fighting the Philistines, a military conflict, he trusted God, but he killed him. But when it's within the relationships, within the redeemed community, his natural family or spiritual family, I mean, all of Israel's in the redeemed community in that general sense, meaning they were, you know, that's their testimony. He didn't touch them. 
He treated them differently than the Philistines. He'll kill the Philistines, I mean, with incredible success. But internally, he goes, I can't do this. I, I got to do this God's way. And the passage I love, I quoted the most, it's 1 Samuel 24, 12. I've used it many, 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 many times. David says, like he's standing here before King Saul. And he had King Saul, most of you know, for seven years approximately, King Saul was chasing him, David. His son-in-law, David, King Saul's his father-in-law, because God anointed the kid to take over the kingship from the dad. And the dad didn't like this. He had 3,000 soldiers chasing David for seven years. Some reprieves in there, but... So David, through this situation has Saul at the end of a sword. God set it up. David's in his 20s. Saul's in his 60s. David's got it. And Saul, like, oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness, you could kill me. And David said, I won't touch you. I will let the Lord judge, or other translations, let the Lord decide. So what David did is he invoked the Lord's activity. Let the Lord avenge me on you. I'm not touching you with my mouth or with my hand. I won't do it. God's watching me. And when you know that God's watching you and you know he cares, you don't have to vindicate yourself. You have to vindicate yourself if you're not sure he's watching or you're not sure he cares. Well, this is a passage I've used for many years, just, I mean, in my thinking, I've been like used it against a person opposed to me several times. Because here, here's what, here's the reason why it's, this is a very serious passage. This isn't flippant. This is David's most powerful secret weapon that you don't use it every time somebody bothers you. You use it rarely. And when you call God in to decide, he's before Samuel, Saul, I mean, let God decide. If David's not walking sincere, this backfires on David because God's watching. You can't play around with this one. You better be walking with a sincere heart if you pull this one out because God never is, is manipulated or changed in his opinion. And you say, decide, as Lord says, well, in that case, I will according to your own words and you're the one in trouble. Matter of fact, you're both in trouble. So my point is you be careful with that one. Be very careful. But the Lord's, I feel like, has blessed me to use it. And each of the times, so some years later, it turned out different without me putting my hand or my mouth. I never said a word. The Lord said, don't talk. I will defend you. And that's, that's one of the hardest things to do is not talk. For 40 years, he told me that 40 years ago, three or four times supernaturally, don't talk. I will defend you. But my answer is good. That's not what's going on here. I want to establish a, a testimony with you, and I want you to know this is real. He didn't say all this, but in 50 years from now, this is going to be necessary in the body of Christ. I didn't hear any of that, but now 47 or 40 years later, because we moved to Kansas City 40 years ago, and that's when this happened. Two times in 1983, 82, and 83, the Lord spoke supernaturally. Don't answer anybody who comes any uh, ad adversaries, accusations, I will defend you. Don't touch it. Don't get them back. Don't whisper again. I, I, don't tell the truth about them. Nothing like that. Never, ever. So I've watched it happen over the years. and But now I know 40 years later, oh, this is going to be a critical part of the end-time church. I didn't think about the end-time church 40 years ago, hardly. I mean, a little bit, but it wasn't, I mean, I said it occasionally because everybody was saying it a little bit. Because there was kind of rapture fever way back then. <clears throat> I mean, all the movies coming out, you know, left behind in the 70s. And so, anyway, that's a big verse. Invoking God's activity. Wow. That's intense. That's what David did over and over. The second thing David did is he didn't seek opportunities for himself. He didn't seize opportunities for, for promotion. He had this remarkable no manipulation about his promotions. I mean, over and over again. And one of the my favorite passages about David in this is 2 Samuel chapter 2. 
Because Saul's been chasing him for seven years, and David's had several occasions where he said, let the Lord decide. I mean, at year seven, he's like, Lord, is, does this work? <laughs> yeah. Seven, delivering you at the seven-year mark is better than the three-year mark because you're different. And our testimony is closer. I know what I'm doing, David. But seven years is a long time to wait for God to answer. Well, anyway, Saul dies. And First Chronicles 10, 14, I don't have it on the notes. God killed Saul. First Chronicles 10, verse 14, up north in the battle. David's down south in Ziklag when, when, when this happens. So now the king over the 12 tribes of Israel is now gone. He's gone. And David's the, everyone knows David's the anointed one. He's 30 years old. The 600 men that have been with him for these years, who've been running cave to cave, they're thinking, this is the biggest day. We're all going to be in the presidential cabinet. We're all going to get good positions. We're going to get good houses. We're going to have really good, you know, uh, uh, budget items that we can use from the government. This is fantastic. David, we did it. David goes, well, not exactly. Verse one. I'm going to ask the Lord if he wants me to be king. Wait, he already anointed you like 10 years ago because he was anointed by Samuel and everybody knew it and then had a couple good years in Gibeon, then about seven years traveling. So about 10 years ago, he got anointed. They go, well, what do, you, what do you mean? You're going to ask the Lord. He goes, well, maybe I'm not supposed to be king right now. Like, are you kidding? So he says, Lord, shall I go up? And the Lord said, Yes. Okay, David, let's go. Be over the 12 tribes. David says, no, no, no. Go up how far? The Lord says, Hebron, just one tribe out of the 12. Okay. He comes back to the boys. One tribe. W what about our positions? <laughs> and he, seven or eight years later, he got all 12 tribes. But actually seven years later when he was age 37. But at 30, he just got one little part. You know, I... I love this about David. And I, um, this sounds kind of weird for me to say this, but this feels so right to live and to do it this way. It was three years ago, because I've been asked about it a few times. I stood right up here and mentioned that I was resigning from the IHOP leadership team, the board. I resigned from everything three years ago. And the Lord made it clear that Stuart Greaves was to give the leadership. So we're coming right to the end of three years. The Lord, I resigned the board, the staff, everything. And when I said that uh, in one of these meetings, you go, oh my gosh. I go, no, I'm still going to be around. I don't need a position to do this. And I haven't been on IHOP staff for three years. <laughs> and so like, who cares? And I don't care. I go, I do, I, I do that prayer room in this community because I love it. And because God loves it. I don't need a role. I don't get money. I don't get anything. I'm not on any board. I'm on no papers, no nothing. I started my own personal ministry, Friends of the Bridegroom. I'm not even on that board. I own my laptop, my cell phone, and my 2007, is it Toyota or Honda? Toyota. No, you're the Honda. Yeah. Toyota, yes. But and, and my point is, I make it another point. That's, that's, oh, no, 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 that's amazing. No, that's not my point. Maybe you think, oh, that's really stupid. <laughs> no, but people have asked me, was, was that hard to do that? I go, zero hard. And I never even thought about it after the Lord said do it. It was so easy. Did you ever have a regret? Not a thought. Because the Lord wanted me to get ready, to get messaging ready to prepare the 20-year-olds. To really lock in to get, so I got my Mike Bickle world over there, FOTB, outside of the organization here, to get young people around the nations prepared with this message, bridegroom, king, and judge. And that's really all I do when I go to prayer meetings and I tell stories. And I told Stuart, I said, I'll come to the ELT as an advisor if you want me. I'll do it for free. I'll preach on Friday nights for free. <laughs> I don't want anything. But anyway, I Carried on too much on that. But my point being, these are the two things I look, I go, I want to do these two things all my days. And why I'm really telling you, it's, it's kind of a fun story for me to tell you, but really what I'm telling you is for you to do them. And many of you are, you would be in these chairs. So I'm really talking to you about you. And I'm just using 
my story to say, this is the way of the David generation. Because many of you will have positions you could squeeze into. The Lord goes, no, don't do it that way. Let me do it for you. Top of page three. I was surprised that in 50 verses, 50 verses of Psalm 18, only four, two, only four responses does David highlight. I would think in, in the most detailed passage of the David generation Psalm, 50 verses, the third largest Psalm in the Bible, there would be about 20 different commands to do something. There's four. And they're all in verse 25 and, and 26. Four, four exhortations, commands. That surprised me, but the reason I'm highlighting it, these magnifies the importance of these four. That they're the only ones mentioned in the most detailed chapter of the David generation prophesying the end of the age of the David generation church. These four are big. Starts off, I'm confused at first when I first read this, when I first start teaching the life of David. Because before he gets to verse 25 and 26, the four verses before he introduces with some, some uh, introductory ideas. And I'm, you're really surprised. He says here in verse 20, God rewarded me according to my righteousness. I was blameless. Well, those of you that know the David story, though he's been harassed by Saul for seven years, he's in Ziklag. And I'm not going to go into Ziklag right now, but some of you know the city of Ziklag is a place where he had, he had spiritual compromises for 16 months. This is the day after Ziklag. And I don't want to break that down. I've taught on Ziklag many times over the years. But he had his core integrity was in place, but he had a number of compromises. And this, he writes Psalm 18, it says it in, in the uh, title, the day he's delivered from Saul, which is the day of the Ziklag rescue and miracle. It's the day his spiritual compromise is now over. That day, God delivered me according to my righteousness. I go, David, you need to read the life of David. And then when I get to see him in heaven, he'll say, oh, Mike, you need to read the, read the life of David because look at the next verse. Another time when Saul, David had Saul at the end of his, he had him a couple times like that, at the end of his uh, spear, so to speak. I mean, it was a different setting, but he killed him. He had all the authority to kill him. And all of his team would say, kill Saul. This is again your next opportunity. David goes, I won't do it. And he says to Saul, he's got Saul right in front of him. He says, Saul, may the Lord repay every man for his righteousness. And here's how he defined it. For the Lord delivered you into my hand. I wouldn't touch you. That's the righteousness I'm talking about. Yes, I was struggling in this and that, but my core, my, my core integrity was in place. And because I did not take matters in my own hands, God called it righteousness. So maybe David does know the life of David. So I go, oh, because I didn't read that for a while. I never got the righteousness that that's how God defined it. Anyway, we're, we're moving on past that one. I, but I want you to see that point. Let's look at these four exhortations, although we're only going to look at one. But I want you to know the four are there, even though I put a little material. We're going to go deep in them in the days to come because these are really four important ones. In each one of these four commands or spiritual laws, how the kingdom operates, they're all in context to how people treat people. That's important to know that because he talks about purity. He's not talking about purity here, meaning, hey, if you struggle with pornography, stop. Or if you struggle with drunkenness, stop. That's a good thing to stumble, but that's not the purity he's talking about. He's talking about purity in relationships, meaning treating people in a way that you're seeking their benefit, even if you don't like them and they don't like you. That's the purity it's actually talking about. It's a whole higher level. No, no, that other level is a very important part of purity, but it's really rough to be pure in relationships. You don't treat me right. You don't like me in the natural. I don't like you, but I'm seeking your best in the will of God without you knowing it. That's the purity he's talking about. Like, oh boy. Well, David, look at paragraph C. With the merciful, David said, let me tell you, I learned something. God will be merciful. If you are merciful to people, 
You are positioning yourself for God to multiply mercy back on your life beyond what he would have. That's one of David's greatest revelations. That's what he exhibits throughout his entire life. He believed, paragraph C, God would give him more mercy to the measure he gave mercy to others, particularly the people that were seeking to harm him. I don't, harming him meaning by undermining him or or, or, or damaging his honor and his positions and, and his those kinds of things. Well, Saul was trying to kill him, actually, too. David understood that God often treats people in the way that people treat people. Meaning, if you treat people with this measure of mercy, God will give you that measure of mercy. Most people kind of know this, but it's not really in the awareness of most of our conversations with the Lord. It's kind of a poster, you know. Yeah, we know that verse. But it's really real to David. Jesus said it really clear, Luke 6. Be merciful. Just in the same way your father's merciful. That just as. That's an intense level of mercy. That's above and beyond. That, it's easy to skip the just as. Verse 36. Give and it will be given to you. Now when we read, I preach this verse, give and it will be given. I preach it with money. And it does apply to money, but that's not what it applies to in context. It still applies to money, but it's talking about mercy. The measure that you use mercy to people that don't deserve the mercy by the way they've treated you, it will be measured back to you. Now, I think growing in mercy is the most challenging virtue in the kingdom of God. By the way, it's the one mentioned most often in the New Testament. Mercy or a synonymous word, loving kindness, which is the same as mercy. Everybody likes the idea of mercy, and everybody likes receiving mercy, but giving mercy, I'm talking about hardcore giving mercy, what I mean by loving people who are not loving you or they don't like you. And they've actually have undermined you but you see God's heart and treat them like God does. That is so uh, counterintuitive to the human heart. It requires, to do that requires we see who God is. It requires we see how he sees us and how he sees others. And I have here, we have to do a lot of spiritual push-ups in this. And what I mean by that, I mentioned this the other day. Okay, this guy, I'm just making up a guy. He's speaking against me. He's hurting me. He's trying to do something bad. And the Lord says, I've had a handful of these. The Lord says, you know, I love that man. Okay. I'm glad. I, God's all over the world. I know. I love that man. And I want you to love him. Well, he doesn't, he's treat me wrong. We'll give you mercy anyway. Y- y- yeah, but. I go, oh yeah, you're giving me mercy that way. That's a push-up. That's a conversation. Uh, Okay, I line back up to that. Yeah, but he'll think he's right if I treat him nice. Well, you think you're right when I treat you nice. That's another push-up. Yeah, but, yeah, but. And every time, you got to do this thousands of times over years before it actually uh, transforms your emotions and your thinking. Then you start thinking, you really like this, God. Then you start thinking, you really like me. Then you start thinking, I'll like him because you like him. We're going to be best friends forever. It's true. I remember this guy really hostile against me, a pastor, really hostile. And the Lord spoke to me and he said, my heart is ravished for him like it's ravished for you. And I love his kids as much as I love your kids. I went, and I thought, wait a second. If that's true, I got it made then for you. And this idea came, you and him will be great friends for billions of years. See him through the lens that I see him. You're in the family for billions of years. So he's, so he's saying mean things for you for a couple of years. So what? And the great news is one particular guy, we ended up reconciling, having dinner and lunch. And I've had a number of, relationships at the five and 10 year mark of hostility of speaking came all the way around. We became friends. And I determined way back then, I'm never going to bring it up, not going to hold them accountable. I'm just going to push delete and treat them like we're good friends, like they never did it. 
And the Lord goes, that's how I treat you. Okay, let's do it that way then. And that's how love is magnified. The, I think, one of the most absolutely critical verses for the end time church, church through history, of course, is Matthew 5, 44. Bless those who curse you with their mouth. Because in the betrayal culture that's about to explode, that's growing right now, there's in the family of God, people cursing you. Lord says, I want you to bless them. I don't want you to exaggerate and tell, you know, exaggerated things, how amazing they are, but find a redemptive virtues in them that are real and talk to me about them. And when someone brings their name up, say those things about them. Because many of you will be friends five and 10 and 20 years later. And don't just bless them with your mouth. Do good, do things for them, help them. Now, here's the part I love. If you do this, this is Jesus, you'll be sons of your father, which means people will see what God's like when they look at your life. This is so supernatural to do good to people who hate you. To do good. I mean, do things that make their life better and stronger and more prosperous. They hate you. The father said, well, there were days you, boy, back when many of my people hated me, but I did good for them because that's what I'm like. I love this verse 45. You will magnify what God's like because they will say, there's no way you can do this without some supernatural help from some invisible God that you, that likes you and you like him. They may not do the math just that way, but you can fake it for a month or two or a summer, but you can't fake it for years. The true you will come out probably after a couple of weeks. But anyway, David excelled in this. I'll give you an example. This is, let me see, 30. Yeah, this is 35 years after Saul is dead. David's now about 66, 67. He dies at age 70. It's about two or three years before he dies. So he's about my age. I'm 68. So he's 66, 67, 68. And there's this man, Shimei. He's standing across the river. It was really a creek. And David's marching with his, with, I mean, with his guys on one side. And this guy comes on the other side of the river, small river. And Shimei says he comes out cursing at David, throwing stones at him, cursing at him. And Abishai, one of David's main guys, soldiers, said, why should we let this dead dog curse you? Let me go take his head off. Look at David. I love it. Look at this. And David said to him, verse 12, no, no. Because he's cursing David because he felt like he usurped Saul and led him to his death 35 years earlier. He's still cursing at him. This this guy's a mean dude, this Shimei guy. And David, look at his answer, verse 12. He goes, it may be, Abishai, the Lord will look on my affliction and he will repay me with good because I am acting godly in the presence of this cursing. My point is David didn't just do this in his 20s and 30s. He does this to the end of his life. He goes, what if I'm kind and I reveal what God's like and God smiles and says, there you go, you did it again. But this was consciously in his mind. Paragraph three, the same thing. The men of Jabesh Gilead Saul dies and they bury him because they were going to, the Philistines were going to do mockery with his body and, you know, totally dishonor him. These guys go get Saul and they bury him and give him honor. David, who's been chased by Saul for seven years. (laughs) David, who Saul's trying to kill. This is like a week afterwards, two weeks after, something like that. David's met these guys. Says, you honor Saul? He goes, yeah. He goes, you're blessed of God. You've shown this kindness to this man. Somebody could have said, your biggest enemy, David. He goes, no, no, forget all that. Forget all that. Let's do this thing God's God's way. He goes, verse six, he says, may the Lord show you kindness. He blesses him. He goes, but not only that, the word also, I will show you kindness too. Because I get the trajectory of showing kindness when there's breaches. I get it. It's like God. Well, top of page four, we're going to, not do those three, but we will in other times. 
that I want you to know that they're there. I'm going to go a few more minutes. I got a couple stories to tell, but I'm going to give you the brief version of the stories. Because at the end of uh, page six, I got a bunch of links. Some of you want to hear more, some don't, but I, got, I, I provide them for you if you want to. The end time church is going to be transformed in the context of betrayal. Paragraph A, the combination of an unprecedented outpouring of the Spirit together with a, a betrayal culture is the optimum environment for the church to be transformed. The Father set it up this way. Like the Father is the one that's raising up the Antichrist because he's going, when the people go through this, they're going to connect with God and they're going to be vessels of his glory and love. And many, many who are even on the wrong side are going to get transformed by it. John 17, the great one, the glory that I will put on you will bring us to family unity and unbelieving world will know that the God of Israel sent Jesus of Nazareth to the earth. It's when unbelievers see people walking in this kind of unity in the face of betrayal. That's why the betrayal is doing it. It's magnifying the love. I have written here multitudes in the end time a church. They're moving in two, two uh, different directions. One group, millions are moving towards this deeper love, this this isn't easy, but I'm going to do these push-ups. So I'm going to be a blesser. And I'm, I'm, my lips will only speak blessing and honor to people. I don't care how much I don't like them. I'm not going that direction. The other group, believers, bittered, hurt, and just their mouth is running fast. And they're talking and talking and talking. And two groups, are good. now a lot, the good news is people go in the wrong direction can't change. And the bad news is people go in the good direction can change. <laughs> so, but millions are moving in those two directions. Paragraph B, Luke 21. This is one of the most painful verses. Betrayed by, this is the end time passage. Betrayed by parents, brothers, relatives, aunts, uncles, friends. This is will reach its intensity right before the Lord returns because that's the environment where people like you will magnify love because it will be so completely unnatural for you to be kind in the face of that. Your family members will be blown away when you are betrayed by others, friends, family, whatever, and you're acting this way. They're going to go, wow, my goodness, what, what do you know about God? I don't know. I know that God's tender and he's kind. That's what I know about him. Paragraph C, moving in the two opposite extremes and saying the same thing again. You know, it's interesting that the nation of Israel, Joseph, the nation of Israel was born because Joseph went to prison in Egypt, right? It was born in the context of family betrayal. Eleven brothers betrayed their little brother, or ten of them did, He's thrown in prison because of the betrayal of his brothers. Because he goes to prison, I don't have this verse here, but, oh, it's fantastic. Genesis 45. Get this one down. You need this one. Genesis 45, verse 5 to 7. But just 45, verse 5 is good enough. His brothers figure out he's the number one guy under Pharaoh in the world. And his brothers go, oh, my gosh, we thought you were dead. You're the wealthiest man. And he said, oh, so beautiful. Joseph goes, don't be grieved. We mean don't be grieved. We put you in prison, tried to kill you. Just don't be grieved. He goes, and don't even be sad for yourself. God sent me to prison. He used you, but now I could be a blessing to you. What? The nation of Israel was born in the context of a man responding right in a family betrayal that put him in prison for a while. And then in Genesis 50, verse 20, I don't have the verse there again, when they're standing before him and they're all, oh my goodness, they're, they're afraid. He says, what you meant for evil, God meant for good to save Israel. The end time church is going to have that same, in the context of betrayal, is going to be used not for the salvation of Israel because when the Gentiles, a hundred million or a billion, however many of them enter into this, that mercy is what Israel will see 
and Israel will be brought to Jesus through the mercy shown them by the Gentiles that have learned mercy. But they didn't learn it in a Bible school. They learned it in the seminary of life by doing those push-ups over and over and over. Because you can't fake this message. This isn't a, a, a rhetoric message. Of, hey, I'm just full of mercy. Well, okay. Well, let us hate you. Let us talk about you. And you be kind to us. For about five years. And then we'll believe you. No one's going to actually say that, but you know what I'm saying. Okay, paragraph D. This is a strange idea, but betrayal, just like bloodshed, this is a strange word. I call it, they are accelerants. I just made that word up. I mean, I know accelerant, what it means, but I was trying to get language for this. Meaning, when you get betrayed, it's the most painful thing in life to be betrayed by someone you trust, that you've opened your heart to. But that pain gives you urgency to go faster, deeper in God's heart or to go the other direction. It speeds up one or the other. And that's why the Lord's using it. Bloodshed's the same way. One group of people with bloodshed will arise in heroic love and throw their life on the line to save. Others will draw back in fear and bitterness and revenge and attack. Two complete different responses of the human race to blood, betrayal and blood. That's why those are the two most prominent things at the end times. But it's going to cause a John 17 people, millions, hundreds of millions. Paragraph E, these are the, I mentioned this, that these are the 15 different situations where David's betrayal, he's the model of, of the end time church and betrayal was his number one thing he dealt with. Number one by far. 15 plus examples. My goodness. Paragraph five. Satan, most effective weapon is accusation. Now, at first you think, no, not really. And I have down here, you, you'll see, you can see on the notes, Revelation 9, 21. Murder, four major weapons. Murder, sorcery, immorality, and theft. Those are his four primary weapons, but accusation actually trumps all of those as the primary tool of Satan. He will do those other four, but accusation is at the front of the line. And the reason why I shared this the other day, if you're in a military context and and and, and you shoot an, the 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 uh, enemy soldier on the other side, kill him. Well, you got one less soldier. You wound him. Ten of his men have to take care of him. You get rid of ten soldiers. So some military, I've heard, I don't know much about military, but said that they wound on purpose strategically because it makes ten more guys have to take care of him. Satan is thinking, if I can get the body of Christ into accusation, I could take hundreds out on each side of the accusation. And they'll be consumed by it, and they won't be in the battle for Jerusalem. If I kill them, well, I'm done with them. But if I just accuse them, they'll take a hundred on their side with them. Accusation really is number one. Paragraph B, John saw three different ex uh, ways or, or responses that, response is not the right way, John saw three ways, okay, it says ways, okay, <laughs> for the saints to overcome Satan's accusations. Look at verse 11, it's right here. The end time church is going to overcome these accusations, but the accusations are real, real, because Revelation 12 is an end time passage. He accuses all through history, but it explodes in the final years leading up to the Lord's return. A whole nother level, that's where the betrayal culture comes out of. They overcome by the blood of the lamb, we understand that. They overcome by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their life even unto death. Well, paragraph one, the blood of the lamb. The, because of the death and resurrection of Jesus, you understand this. We have full access to God's heart for free, forever, for full. The blood of the lamb, absolute. The word of your testimony is, is one that's a lot maybe don't understand. The word of your testimony isn't, you know, like in 1971 on June 9th, I prayed the sinner's prayer and gave myself to Christ. That's true. That's not the word of my testimony. That's a little statement. That's cool. The word of my testimony is what my narrative is before God. That's my testimony. 
what I think God says and sees when he looks at my life. And that's the area that so many are not established in. They've got to get the divine narrative, but it's not enough for me to see who I am and to say what God says about me and nothing more and nothing less. I got to say what God says about you, nothing more, nothing less. About my enemies. The word of my testimony is the Lord says, what do you think I see in what I say about that person accusing you? I think you think they're wrong. Well, no, that's not really what I'm saying. I'll work with them on things, but that's not what I'm saying about them right now. What am I saying? Don't say anything about them or about yourself that God's not saying. What is he seeing and saying? That's the word of your testimony. That is critical. That's a big subject. That's a, you know, a big, long one. I mean, I'm going to move on. But stay involved in the narrative of God for your life. You have sacred space. I've had people, good, bad, and ugly, uh, whatever, over the years. I am not letting that man's words into my conversation with God. But he says you're, and they said you're, but God doesn't say it. I love God. God loves me. Let's go forward. That's what I say. This is critical. Paul mentioned that. He goes, verse 37 in Romans 8, we're more than conquerors because we're persuaded. Beloved, guard the sacred space of your conversation with God. Don't let another person's opinion get inside of that sacred space. By nature, we're defensive and rejection. We got rejection and, de and we're defensive. So when they say it, we want to say, yeah, but the yeah, Lord says, no, no, just don't even let that in. You might have to do a bunch of push-ups to get to that place. I have found that over the years, I have had this pleasure. I've been, we've been in Kansas City 40 years. And I have felt the Lord's pleasure day after day for 40 years. I don't mean I'm overcome with his presence, but I've had a clear testimony of his pleasure. The most powerful thing in my life and your life is to feel that. It's not the one thing conference grew. No, it's not, hey, they gave you the Truman property. No, no. The idea that I have a conscious awareness for 40 days, 40 years, he smiles. I go to bed every night with a clear conscience, literally every night. That is the greatest gift a human can have in their heart. But all of us can do that. And most, most of you in this room do, do do that. I know I'm saying you didn't do something wrong, but you didn't agree that it was okay. You renounced it, you repented of it, and you're finished with it. We've all have to go to bed with a clear conscience literally every night, and we have to stick into the divine narrative. You do that, and I'll add one more thing. Uh, it's under paragraph three, love your life. Uh, three things. I was talking to, I talk to people on this a little, all the time. I go, here's how you overcome. Well, of course, the blood of the lamb, that's foundational. The other one, stay in the divine narrative for you and the divine narrative for them, the ones that don't like you. Number two, Go to bed every night with a clear conscience and have the sense of his pleasure in your life. Number three, every day. I mean, literally every day. Try to open your Bible and have a, I call pray, read the word, conversation with the Lord. And if I stir up the conversation, go to bed with a clear conscience and stay riveted in the divine narrative, those are the three things and I base it on the blood of the lamb, you can overcome everything because a hundred other issues will fall into place if you do those two or three things. And they're all doable. Those are None of those are hard. So I look back over the years and I go, Lord, I'm so grateful. I don't, I'm not, not, not boastful. I'm just so grateful that you've given me grace to do this for these years. And I'm in a company of people. Many of you have done this 10, 20, 30 years. This is the future, and it's doable for all of us. Okay, Roman numeral five. I'm just going to tell ever so brief stories here. Two prophetic encounters. And I've got the data, you know, if you want to see more. But in August 1984, I have a, a heavenly encounter. I've had one in 50 years. It was August 8th, 1984 where I stood before the presence of the Lord, literally in heaven. I'm standing there. 
Now, I'm not going to tell the story, but if you want to hear it, and some do because they say, tell my chariot story. I go, nah. I told it once, as far as I know, publicly in 2009 on session two in the prophetic history. I think it's the only time I've ever told it. Maybe one other time. I can't remember, but I think not. But I get asked in back rooms all the time, tell the chariot story. <laughs> okay, maybe. But if you want to hear it, 2009, I give a, a little bit on it. But I'm standing before God. And the Lord tells me, he sternly tells me. I mean, I'm standing there awake. I'm touching my arm. I go, I got an elbow. I go, I don't know where I'm at. I don't know what's happening. Well, I mean, it was really intense. And he goes, young man. He's right here. I'd never look. He said, be patient. You will cause great harm and much turmoil to many peoples. I don't know where I am, and I know, I know who's talking, but I don't know where I am, and I don't know why I'm getting yelled at. I wasn't yelled at at Better Stern. That was volume four. Man, I'm standing there just kind of trembling. He uppers it. He goes, young man. Now it's a volume six. It says the exact same thing. And then a few moments later, I'm trembling. He says the same thing the third time, and the only thing I said is, Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's all I could say. And then he, I'm going to skip a bunch, but he tells me to get in a chariot. And this chariot spoke of end time ministry. And he pointed at a chariot and an angel was there. He said, get in the chariot. And I fell down and I cried out, no, no, no. It would be injustice for a man like me to be in a chariot like that. No. And he said, it's been ordained for you. Get in the chariot. So I got in the chariot, and then we went straight up in this vast sapphire blue expanse of the and the and the spirit says the knowledge of God, and then some other things happen. But that's that. Fantastic, the most dramatic ex experience of my life. That's August '84. I'm telling you this for a reason. And again, if you want to hear it a little bit more, session two in 2009, prophetic history. The very next month. September 84, it's in another encounter completely opposite of this. And it's related to the chariot mandate. And it's the black horse. And I'm not going to tell the story. I've got a few links if you want to hear it, some of the black horse story. But they're one month apart. The two probably most dramatic encounters I've ever had in my life were one month apart. And the black horse which is the dragon of Revelation 12. In Revelation 12, it's a dragon. And this one is a literal eight-foot chest, 15 feet wings. I mean, this Pegasus or whatever you call it. This mighty beast dragon comes flying down to me, and he strikes me with rage. He actually hits me on my knee, like breaks my kneecap nearly. I can't walk for 30 days. It's a spiritual experience, but it literally happened. I mean, I'm like this. So it was what happened. I go, I get kicked by a horse. They go, we thought you didn't like horses. I go, oh, this, I don't like this one for sure. And I didn't talk about it for a long time, but it was the bizarrest thing. But here's what happened. Michael, the archangel, comes. And he speaks a sentence. If Michael the he spoke actually two sentences, but if Michael the archangel shows up in an earthly context and says a sentence, that's powerful. And he comes and he says, when you go to the east, the rage, the idea is the rage of Satan of this black horse will kick you when you go to the east. What does that mean? And I'm not going to go into that right now. Up at page six, the whole story. I just wanted you to put that together. So, paragraph C. I realize I've gone quite a long time here. I've gone over an hour, but I'm going to bring this to an end pretty quick. But this is so important. I just want this document for our spiritual family. In, yes, paragraph C. In May of this year, we were involved, and in, all of you know, mobilizing 5 million Gentiles to pray an hour day for Israel in May. And a lot of people were involved, and not, 
I was in real involvement. A whole lot of others were too. But in April, before that happens in May, we have a million that are doing it. By May, it was 5 million. And I ask, as you know, the leaders in Israel, and I asked the mother, uh, demographic, you know, world prayer movement, st- st- statistician type people. Has there ever been a time when 10,000 Gentiles prayed for Israel for 10 days? Gentiles, they go never in history. So is it, give me a sense of what 5 million praying for 21 days. They said it's the most dramatic shift of the body of Christ in history doing this for, for Israel. Well, anyway, in April, we got a million. By May, it's 5 million. And I got our team together. I said, 40 years ago, before, 39 years ago, Michael came. And you know that when Michael shows up, I got a few verses there, which I skipped. Michael shows up when it pertains to Israel. I don't know that back in 1984. He says, when you go to the east, you'll be struck by the rage of Satan. I said, April, I got our team together, a bunch. I go, guess what, guys? We're going east. Oh, my goodness. This is real. The rage of Satan, he's an accuser. He will strike. He will strike Israel. He will strike the prayer movement that's a part of this. But this was a personal thing too because Michael stood right before me and said these things. I don't want to explain the whole thing right now. Okay. And Isaac, Isaac Bennett, he gave me a word. He said, the way these are connected, I I really appreciate this. He goes, you won't get in, you'll get in your chariot, whatever that means. That's symbolic. I don't even know what that means. But you'll never get into that sapphire sea of blue of the knowledge of God without the black horse attacking you. He said, any more than Joseph would never get into prison in Egypt and save Israel without his family betraying him. He said, I hope that's not too intense <laughs> or something like that. And I went, yeah, because in the context of that, you find the truth of God's tenderness in his heart. And you have a chance to magnify what he's like. Okay, so paragraph D, coming down to the wire here. In 2021, I have two powerful dreams. I share it with a few people. And in these two dreams, Psalm 55 is highlighted. Psalm 55, you, you, some of you know it, verse 12. It's David saying, I'm betrayed not by a friend. I mean, not an enemy, but a familiar friend. We have sweet fellowship inside of the inner circle. And the Lord says, this is going to happen. But not, I'm not thinking of me. I'm thinking of the global body of Christ. This is going to start happening. Because it happened to David and it happened to Jesus. And I'm thinking the global body, I mean, I'm part of it. So yeah, me too. But I'm thinking global body of Christ. Okay, because I got this betrayal culture. I know that's coming back. This could be 10 years ago. I mean, I had, because when you get a prophetic dream, many times it's 10 years later. You don't really know, but I had had a few people. I go, just pray about it for insight. Well, when we went to, so I was concerned and was wondering about it. Hmm. Then in paragraph E, a couple months later, because these two dreams were in 2021, a couple months later, some, I shared this publicly. I had the vision of the open, the open vision of the snake in my office. (laughs) I've had three open visions in 50 years, meaning where I'm awake, I see it right there, and there's a movie screen on the wall. I had three of them, 50 years. And this was this snake, which is the serpent, which is the, the accuser. I'm just looking up, praying in my office like this. The lights are dim, but not off. All of a sudden, a snake is in the midair. I'm going, there's a snake in the midair. But it's not at all funny then. You know, and this snake is coming towards me. And, is, and in Romans 3, the snake, the poison of asps, it's accusation. And he's, that kind of thing. I'm going, and, and I'm just kind of stuck. I can't even get words out. And it's not, I'm not super afraid, but I, I, I'm so perplexed. I don't know. Uh, then I say, in the name of Jesus, stop. And he stops right in midair, about 10 feet away. And then he comes about three inches closer. 
in the name, I didn't raise my voice, in the name of Jesus, stop. He backs up an inch or two or something like that. He comes a little bit closer. I said, in the name of Jesus, I was pointing, stop. And it backed up real slow. It was going back up that way, right into the corner, coiled up and disappeared. And I had this sense of victory. And I said, oh, so there will be accusations, but there's ways they won't prevail. So I was so encouraged because of an open vision. So yesterday, paragraph F, which is October 19th, I'm watching Einstadtsgruppen. <laughs> Say Einstadtsgruppen. Those are the Nazi death squads. I've seen this series about uh, a bunch of times. I, I don't love it, but I, I, I just like to watch it. <laughs> And as I'm watching it, it's horrible. This is 1941 up in Lithuania, and, you know, in the Baltic states. They're, the Germans are invading and they're granuling the Jews and killing like 30,000 at a time in a day. This is because they didn't start the, the actual death camps where they burned them till about 42, late 42. So for about a year or two, they just killed them and put 30,000 in open graves. You've seen the, the, uh, the uh, films of it. Now I'm watching it. And I'm grieving for Israel because I believe that great trouble is coming to Israel. And the first line of defense for Israel is the praying church. But it's the praying church that's prepared in mercy, which means the praying church that's been refined through the fires of betrayal and persecution and that they are filled with love and they're overflowing and they're even fighting for the people that betray them. They're fighting for their good. I mean, and contending for it. So I'm looking at them, and then that's when I start travailing because I'm looking at the Israel thing. And that's when the Lord makes it clear, I have a preemptive strike. You know, earlier in the news that day, they say they have a preemptive strike. I do too. From the beginning of the ages, I have a plan. And so I just start travailing, and I'm just groaning, And I, but it's for Israel. And then the Lord makes it clear to me, he said, the betrayal is all about getting you guys all, the global body of Christ, out of sync so you're not in place to be salvation for Israel, a vessel of salvation. I mean, my God's salvation, but bringing them in. And so I'm writing all day long. Great zeal was on me. Like betrayal, I'm not afraid of it at all. It's like, this is a seminary of the glory of God, just like the Antichrist being raised up. And there's going to be a victorious church in John 17, unity filled with love. And we don't need to be afraid. And we need to fight for everybody to love them and to reveal the love of God to them in a supernatural context where it's only supernatural that you would love them that way. Okay, so the, what are the three empty actions? Okay, let's all stand before the Lord. Okay, you don't have to do any of this, but I'm going to do it. Yeah, and by the way, when I say stand for the Lord, you don't really have to. I never liked it when the preachers go stand and hold hands, like, oh, come on. Just do what you want to do. When I say stand, you don't really have to, though. Preemptive action, number one. We want to call on the name of the Lord. An hour ago, those storm, heavenly storm glory... We, we're going to begin to ask the Lord to those tokens of his glory that we're not familiar with as the body of Christ. We want to get this into our conversation for the next 10 years in a big, big way and start asking the Lord to release dimensions of his glory in the midst of conflict that will bring his will into fullness. That's what David did in verse 6. I was in distress. I called. He heard me in his holy temple. Then the earthquake hit. And I have no doubt that David's in a battle. He cries out, or earthquake comes, and the Philistines are routed in context of that earthquake, but it never gets put in 1 Samuel. But these are the kinds of things he was talking about. Mostly in military context, they happen, but not only. Second thing we want to do, we want to contend against the enemy's activity. We want to resist him. James says, resist the devil, he'll flee. But we got to resist the devil like Michael did. He didn't rail at the devil. He just said, the Lord rebuke you. That's all he ever said. The Lord rebuke you. And it's not necessarily the devil himself, but demons are coming. And here's, here's my point. 
There's a passage, I don't have the, the uh, notes here, in Zechariah chapter 1, verse 15. It's a strange passage, Zechariah 1, 15, where the enemy nations came with Babylon to discipline Israel. He went to Babylon in captivity for 70 years. He told them through the prophet, you nations, you, he goes, I'm angry because you exceeded the boundaries of what I wanted you to do. I wanted you to bring this punishment to them. You took it to the next step. And he goes, now I'm angry at you. Zechariah 1 verse 15. My point is in God's sovereignty, he'll allow the enemy to go beyond what he sovereignly, I mean, what he or what he had planned, he sovereignly gives them the room and wants the body of Christ to stand in the gap and say no. I'm thinking of the satanic activity that hit your children. I don't mean that, I'm not talking about so much uh, like a, a physical uh, problem. I'm talking about strife and accusation, breaking families and ministries and nations and cities. And thirdly, we want to invoke God's activity and we want to bless the people who curse us. So before God, we call for the storm, the heavenly storm tokens. Before Satan, we say, in the name of Jesus, the Lord rebuke you. We cancel. We don't know if you've gone past the boundaries, Zechariah 115. We don't know that. But we take a stand. And to the person that's accusing you, you don't say, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. You don't say, I hope a storm hits you. You don't do that. You look and just say, let the Lord decide. Nothing more, nothing less, except for then bless and do good for them. Let the Lord decide. That's the three-prong approach as we go forward this next 10 years. And my 20 years, whatever, I'm, that's a made-up number. But my point is not for the next month. I believe these three things need to get into the conversation of the body of Christ. So I'm praying these for Israel right now. So, Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. Lord, I ask you for tokens of your heavenly glory to break in the conflict in Israel now. Even though many of the soldiers would only think the weather got bad, you would know and prophetic people would see it was you who did it. I ask you for the manifestation of the glory of the Lord, the heavenly realm, that throne storm glory realm to break in for your salvation purposes. We believe you even tonight. Father, we take authority over the plans of the evil one that seeks to go beyond the boundaries of the discipline you've ordained for Israel. And we could say this about our own lives. God's ordained discipline in our lives. But some men take it beyond the boundaries, that black horse raging. Father, I take authority and I say, the Lord rebuke you. I speak that to the camp of the enemy because there's many principalities. The Lord rebuke you. And the rage to go above and beyond the discipline that's been ordained. We resist you and we say we cut off your assignment. Your demonic strategy. And all of us probably have somebody in our life somewhere in our families. If you got large families or somewhere, the workplace, where they're speaking negative about you. I'm not saying right now we're invoking let the Lord decide. You got to do that slowly, carefully. But we're going to bless them right now. Take that name. Lord, I want to bless them. I ask you to touch their children. Lord, you love them like you love me. You love them like you love us. Show tenderness to them. Lord, to help us to do good for them, we ask. Lord, I ask for reconciliation in many, many relationships. In the next 10 years that will get broken, I ask that they will be restored. And then after that, then after that, then after that. And Lord, we know that we went to the east in May of this year. We know that Satan's raging. Michael said, when you go to the east, but we know it's about Israel. We know that the enemy wants to just get us derailed so we get off course related to Israel. That's why you sent Michael for that very brief two-sentence visitation. Well, he said two sentences. 
So God, we ask you for mercy. God, we want mercy to abound. We want everybody to be covered in mercy. And just take a minute and just pray for your situation. Pray quietly, pray out loud if you want. Here we are, Lord. Lord, thank you that you grabbed my attention with that intercession yesterday for Israel. Thank you for that Psalm 55 dream, those two dreams two years ago to alert me that you're actually using this for the good of your people. Thank you for the timing of May that we know that this global escalation, so we're not surprised by it, will be happening all around the world. Not just in our little world, all around the world. Oh, 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 I just want to that. Father, I thank you that that snake that I said in the name of Jesus, it did not prevail. Oh, that accusation did not prevail by the blood of Jesus. I just want a heart Lord, I thank you for the testimony of your pleasure over this house. Lord, there's many things we need to grow in, but we sense your pleasure because of your kindness to us. That is for me, Lord, we say that our hands and our words will not have any payback to anyone, ever. That freely we forgive and freely we forgive. We set our heart to never do payback with our hands or with our words, ever. But only to bless even those who hate us. We set our heart, we want to be like you, Jesus. We love your leadership. We love this opportunity to go deep in love. That is for This next five or ten years in the global body of Christ. The opportunity to go deep in love. Millions of us. I just want a heart that is for me. Love that you have for Jesus and put inside of me. Well, we're going to worship till 10 because we always did that on Friday night here. And we move down to the prayer room, but feel free to step out. Some of you, it's already an hour past what you're thinking. So no pressure at all to stay here till 10. But if you slip out, I just ask that you talk over there so folks here can watch. Oh, oh, oh. I just want a love that is falling in love. Oh, 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 Lord, release the tokens of your heavenly storm glory. Even in this city and this nation, tokens of your glory, of your intervention into human affairs. Though we don't understand this very well, but begin to teach us. Teach us how to love like you love. Teach us how to love like you love. Spirit. Teach us how to love. Show us how to love you. Show us how to love you. Oh, give us your heart. Jesus, your heart. In the way you love. Show us how to give mercy. Show us how to give mercy more and more. How to bless those who hate us. Those who speak against us. Those who speak against our friends. Bless our brothers, sisters. 
Give us a heart that forgives over and over again. Show us how we love our enemies. Show us how we love those who hurt us. A heart that is not easily offended. A heart that's not easily offended. It's not Show us how to extend mercy to those we don't think need mercy. To see the way that you see them, Father, give us your heart for them. Come to us what's in your heart, what is in your heart. Mercy poured out for our enemies. We want to know the way you like You lose grace and mercy to give grace And mercy, Father, give us grace And mercy to give grace And mercy, Father, give us grace and mercy to give grace and mercy God you give us grace and mercy to give grace and mercy God you give us grace and mercy to give grace and mercy God you give us grace and mercy Put it inside of me and burn it on my heart, Lord, like a seed, like a seed. In the fans of your presence, in the floods of persecution, in the cover of the culture, it's still real, it's still real. Oh. Oh, I just want a love that is holy love. Oh, 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 I just want a love that is holy love. Oh, Just wanna that is for me. Oh, I just wanna that is for me. Oh, I just wanna.